We are Eye Connections, and it's time to talk about change. To work together and rebalance our global systems. To create a more equitable world for everyone. To celebrate women and their achievements. Acknowledge their trials and their triumphs. To challenge biases and recognize that the leadership of women is essential. We choose to invest in our future because equality is non-negotiable for investment. And change emerges from leadership. We must overcome discrimination, challenge gender inequality, and balance our responsibilities. Every challenge comes with a choice. I choose to challenge. I choose to challenge. We, we choose, choose to challenge. challenge. Welcome to the next session of the Changemaker Forum, a fireside chat with neuroscientist Dr. Tara Swart. This session is sponsored by Mainstream, an independent third-party administrator with over 300 employees globally. Choosing to challenge, the theme of this year's International Women's Day, is something that takes more than just policy action. Understanding how people think about diversity and inclusion and how they are influenced by the arguments is a crucial factor in creating progress. In this session, our very own Diana Arakelian, Chief Marketing Officer at iConnections, will interview neuroscientist and best-selling author of The Source, Dr. Tara Swart. A senior lecturer at MIT Sloan, Tara is passionate about communicating practical strategies to help people get the best from their brain and their body. We hope you enjoy the session. Hi, Tara. Thank you for taking part in our Changemaker Forum. We've invited changemakers from finance, tech, and law to discuss their journeys, paths to success, and how they choose to challenge. And I'm so excited to speak to you about your work in the area of neuroscience and how it can be applied to uh, leadership. I discovered your work just over a year ago when a friend gave me your book, The Source, and, and then I met you in person quite randomly on King's Road <laughs> while you were trying waiting for a cab and I've followed your work since then and have used the principles from the source in personal and professional life so for the benefit of our audience watch, uh, watching can we talk about your career path that led you to neuroscience thank you so much Diana I just want to start off by saying it's a complete honor to be part of this so thank you for inviting me um, my career path makes complete sense to me looking backwards and there are sort of definitely threads that bring everything together, but it has been quite varied. So I went to medical school and then I took three years out to do a PhD in neuroscience. Um, and then I came back to the clinical part of medical school and decided to become a psychiatrist. So I then did the year of medicine and surgery that you have to do and when you never sleep. And then I specialized in psychiatry for seven years. And at that point, I'd been thinking about it for a while, but I decided to make a really big career change and go into executive coaching. This was now around the time of the global financial crisis. So actually, quite fortunately for me, a former psychiatrist who was available to coach stressed executives was kind of, you know, in high demand. So, so that's how it started. And then about three years later, neuroscience started to become like a buzz topic in business and leadership. So I started doing more speaking. And since then I've evolved the career, I like to do different things because neuroscience applies to so many different things. So I've been the world's first ever neuroscientist in residence at a hotel, the Corinthia Hotel in London. Um, I was in residence at Annabelle's in Mayfair for a while. I've worked with Brands Fashion. I'm an ambassador for Aromatherapy Associates. And as you know, I've recently um, been so delighted to become a trustee at the Lady Garden Foundation, which is for gynecological cancers. That's really fascinating. And Tara, so, and how has neuroplasticity been taken up by the business community? I know you've developed the MIT course on neuroscience and leadership. And so I'd love to hear some of the principles you use in the course and any practical tips and uh, advice that um, you can discuss on uh, from the course. 
Absolutely. So neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to grow and change throughout our lives well into adulthood, much longer than we thought was possible before we had sophisticated scanning technologies. And so that concept underlies creating new habits, thought patterns, behaviors, and basically sustainable behavior change. So it's so completely relevant to leadership and business in terms of um, handling all the change that we go through, bringing in new change and transformation and bringing in new skills as a leader like emotional intelligence or resilience to stress. So I've been running the two-day in-person program at MIT Sloan Neuroscience for Leadership for seven years, co-teaching with Professor Deborah Ancona, who's a, a leadership um, psychologist. And then I created another two-day course called Applied, Neuro Applied Neuroscience because there was so much demand for a deeper dive into the neuroscience. And so that one is more for yourself, but also getting more out of your team. So it's kind of applying the neuroscience more widely and includes a section on organizational, neuro um, organizational neuroplasticity and um, the future of work in terms of how technology and AI will change the way that we have to work. Um, there's also actually a section on gender diversity, cultural diversity, and financial risk taking and decision making. So quite sort of specialist topics. And then recently I um, created and filmed entirely in lockdown, a new six week self-paced online program for MIT Sloan, um, which is called Neuroscience for Business. And that's the one where there's a major section on neuroplasticity two sections on brain agility, an introduction to neuroscience and how it applies to leadership, um, and then sort of special topics on trust, purpose, leadership vision, and leaving a legacy. That is so important, Tara, especially given, I think it's been well documented how, you know, a lot of leaders are really struggling to retain the cultures of their firms, in the post COVID um, and actually during COVID, during the pandemic to help their staff adapt to this new environment. So what are the, some of the key principles of, from neuroscience that can be applied to creating this sort of inclusive cultures to also um, to leading with purpose? Are there any tips that uh, you can share? Yeah, there are so many that I'll have to be quite thoughtful about just picking out a few that would be really sort of practically applicable for people who are listening now. Um, so basically, I think really the first thing I'd like to say is that understanding a bit about neuroscience and particularly neuroplasticity helps people to appreciate quite how complex and amazing our brains are. And how if you know a few things about how to get the best out of it, you can really exceed the potential that you may have thought that you had because the brain is so capable of learning new ways of thinking and being and um, you know, pivoting when necessary. So there are some specific examples of neuroplasticity that I use as case studies. So things like recovery from stroke, um, some old animal experiments about how if a dominant arm is tied up, then the map in the brain for the other arm starts to grow and expand. And, you know, um, so those are primate studies, but it also shows that people can adapt in that way, whether it's a physical or a mental thing. Um, understanding things like how when London cab drivers, we met when I was waiting for a cab, London cab drivers who've learned the knowledge have actually physically grown and changed the parts of the brain that integrate memory and navigation. So, you know, lots of compelling examples of the fact that if you um, pay, you know, raise awareness of things that you might need to change, focus your attention on opportunities to try new behaviors, deliberately practice new behaviors, and find a way to keep yourself accountable, whether it's through a colleague or an app, um, that's the way to create that sustained, sustainable behavior change based on the principles of neuroplasticity. That's really great. And are there any particular insights from neuroscience and neuroplasticity uh, you can give uh, into gender inequality? Yes, you sort of touched on that in the previous question and I didn't come to it, but you know, I think the biggest thing that we've learned, there's been a lot of controversy um, 
my male neuroscience professor colleagues don't really want to speak about it because they get trolled all the time. But I think, you know, that's unfortunate. And there are some things that we need to be saying. And the major one is that, you know, there are some differences between men and women, like height. The differences in our brain are less than that of height. And, you know, if you had a room full of 100 people and you asked them to line up by height, it wouldn't be all the men on one side and all the women on the other. There are some taller women and some shorter men. So it's like that. And that most of the differences that we focus on in business are socialized. They're not inherent. So things like training and um, certain hormonal changes, you know, make a difference to this. So, you know, an obvious one is... Um, post-pregnancy there can be a confidence of crisis but if you work on elevating testosterone levels it can completely overcome that conversely at the other end of the scale we see men from sort of 35 to 55 experience some sort of male menopause or andropause where their testosterone levels drop quite rapidly and this affects things like risk-taking and decision-making and again that can be you know if you have a blood test and you know that that's an issue then there are various ways that you can decide to work on that. So I think, you know, I really want to move away from this idea that there's any significant difference between, you know, the brains of different genders and just focus on everyone using neuroplasticity to play to their strengths and identify some development areas that maybe, you know, we can bring some new tools and techniques in for. Absolutely, that is fascinating. Um, and Tara, I'd love to discuss the role technology uh, plays in our lives. And um, tech co companies have often consulted uh, neuroscience to enhance their products, but these techniques have been criticized. And at our Global Alts Conference in January, Tristan Harris discussed the enormous power and impact technology has in steering human attention and behavior. And in your book, you also said that we are now at a moment where technology will disrupt our minds and bodies more than we can begin to imagine. So are we smart enough to use technology responsibly? Such a great question. Um, I actually did a TEDx talk in 2015 about technology and the future of humanity. And I ended it with a picture of this kind of very gorgeous robot and I said I believe that by the end of my life I'll be a human AI hybrid so I don't know if it's going to happen you know I don't know at what pace this will happen but you know there's already a lot of exciting research into things like brain implants and um, light exoskeletons for paralyzed people um, we're able to map out people's dreams and sometimes what they're thinking um, there's the idea of creating this brain net where everybody's consciousness would be uploaded so that I would know everything that you know and you would know everything that I know. Um, holographic libraries of, um, you know, sort of they, the example that I've seen used is Winston Churchill. So all of his speeches and appearances and writing have been recorded. And then you get a hologram of him and you can ask him any question. And, you know, there's obviously a lot of data available. Um, but obviously since Churchill's time now, we've all got a digital footprint. So there would be lots of photos and, um, you know, social media posts that could be used to sort of create a, an, a you know, a version of our lives. Um, even things like creating art using the power of your mind. Um, so it's really exciting. I always suggest that people watch programs like B Black Mirror because that's a way of preparing humanity for the future that's coming because I do, believe that we're smart enough to use technology in a good way but I I'm concerned that we're not emotionally intelligent enough to use it in a good way because um, in my TEDx talk I said that some indigenous people in the United States when they're making a big decision about their community they sit in a circle and they imagine the consequences of that decision seven generations into the future and I don't think we even think really about one generation into the future. So, you know, technology is can be great. It's definitely accelerating at a huge pace and has already significantly changed our lives. Um, I'd love to see us being more thoughtful about what it could mean in the future. Isn't it? That's really interesting. And actually, that sort of leads to my next question, next question about the future where AI and robotics will be replacing some of the uh, human work in many industries. And what does that mean for our brains? And what kind of thinking will we need to succeed in this environment? 
Yeah, so it's getting a bit better already, but you know, the initial reaction to that has largely been robots are coming to take our jobs and there's something to be feared. So there's been a big fear response. And I think it's really important to remember when when we see things like face recognition or voice recognition and we feel afraid by that, that there's no robot or computer that's better at voice recognition or face recognition than our brains are. And, you know, technology in that way should be viewed as a tool. Like if you have a really good toaster and you know how to use it, you can make perfect toast, but the toaster can't make toast by itself and it can't make you a cup of tea. So I'm all about reducing the fear that's around this change. Um, however, having said that, it's going to happen faster than we um, can imagine, as, as I've sort of said before. And so we'll need to become adept as managers and leaders at understanding the implications of having mixed human and robot teams and how people may struggle to interact with a team that's so different to what they've been used to in the past. And just managing that new dynamic, which is more like a three-way dynamic than a two-way dynamic, if you know what I mean. Um, so I think, you know, staying kind of proficient in maths and science and problem solving and kind of staying ahead of the curve with technology is, is the ideal thing to do. And Tara, what about, so you work with several brands, um, as you mentioned, as an ambassador, as an advisor, how does this work help your ideas about the human brain? Yeah, so I probably should have qualified that by saying that my, my main work is, is consulting for hedge funds. So that's um, sort of quite a specific type of person who really does like to always have the edge and um, kind of, you know, absolutely fulfill and exceed their potential. So I've definitely, my, my reason for diversifying was that I felt neuroscience applied to everyone and everything, but it's definitely helped me to learn some perspective around how neuroscience appeals or works in different industries. And so that's kept my perspective broad and, and I've been able to sort of, you know, even bring ideas from other industries back to my original work, which is more in the hedge funds. And um, Tara, what role does spirituality play in your work? I think it's a real balance because, you know, we're talking about technology, which kind of seems like the other end of the spectrum, you know, all very logical and data driven. Um, and so up until I wrote the source, which I wrote in 2018, it came out in 2019, I kept very separate the fact that, you know, I'm a scientist and a faculty at MIT Sloan, um, professionally and the fact that personally I was interested in things like meditation, yoga, visualization, um, manifestation, the laws of attraction. Um, so in writing the book I actually did you know rigorous research about applying cognitive science to those sorts of concepts that have previously been explained through vibrations and frequencies and you know just thought of as new age and sort of not backed up by empirical data. Um, the response to the book has probably had an even stronger impact on me than, than just writing it and seeing how those two things could really, um, you know, be very much married together. So, you know, sort of completely non-scientific people who are into spirituality, loving the science aspect of it, um, you know, very professional, academic or scientific um, people who wouldn't normally welcome sort you know the sorts of topics that are covered by that umbrella of spirituality becoming much more open to it because of the combination with the science and so actually on my six-week online program for MIT there is a six-week physical exercise schedule that goes alongside the teaching and the learning and the homework um, and that has a combination of yoga we had two videos made especially for executives to you know to try to benefit from yoga um, some aerobic exercise, body scanning and um, weight bearing exercise as well. So to really show people the benefits of various forms of exercise on your brain and your body. And then, um, as you know, I've been working on developing a neuroplasticity based meditation app. So we've also put links to, to some of the specific meditations throughout that six week course. Um, so, you know, I really 
again, a, a word that has been seen as kind of a bit left field in the past is holistic. But all that means is that you're taking a whole brain or whole human approach to a problem. And so integrating things like physicality, spirituality, um, into teaching, into leading is to me, you know, has to be done. So I love that combination. Yes. And what is the time frame for the app? When are you thinking of launching it? Um, soon. <laughs> I can't give you an exact date, um, but it's been through beta testing and um, we're just kind of, you know, neatening it up at the moment. And then I'm very excited about some extra levels that I'll be adding to it once the sort of the first version is out. Um, but I'll, you know, it'll be all over my social media. So yeah. yeah, looking forward to that. And Tara, as you know, the theme of this year's International Women's Day is choose to challenge. And, you know, from our conversation today, and from what I know of your work, it is fair to say that you've been choosing to challenge throughout your career. But what would be your key choose to challenge pledge for this year and for the near future? Yeah, so it's so really interesting um, for me, which is that in the last couple of years, there's been this idea of, or this conflict perhaps of, you know, can you be a scientist? Can you represent an institution like MIT and openly speak about spirituality? Um, so I would say this is gonna be the year that I challenge any doubts that I have about that. And I really show everybody how I can do that and in a way that's really helpful for people. So it's gonna be, the ultimate merging of science and spirituality in a way that's really practical, non-secular, um, and gives people tools to actually make their lives better. Mm. That sounds great. And actually, Tara, I mentioned, you know, I, I applied some of the principles from the book in personal and professional life, but it was, I had heard about meditation, um, visualization and uh, manifestation before, but I love the fact that you're in your book, it was very much science-based. You had the research behind it to explain why actually it works and it makes sense to apply some of the principles. So um, that was really great. Tara, Alvin Toffler said that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. Um, this quote in some ways summarized a neuro neuroplasticity for me, um, but for the benefit of our audience watching, could you give us a description of what neuro neuroplasticity is? So that's actually one of my favorite quotes and it does align very nicely with neuroplasticity. There's just one area that, um, just to get the facts correct, which is that in terms of changing behavior, you can't unlearn something that's already in your brain, like you can't unlearn a language. So it's a case of overwriting with the new desired behavior, the way that you'd like to be. So, you know, with things like building emotional intelligence, I encourage people to increase their eye contact, to, you know, really pay attention, to listen, to ask open-ended questions, rather than saying, don't do that thing that you were doing before. And I know that a lot of team leaders have found that really helpful because they found a way then of saying to people, you know, rather than I don't like the way you present me these documents, to say, thank you for these documents but could you try in future doing it this way instead? That has a much better impact on the person's brain and sets them up to be able to make that change in a positive way and sort of, you know, without having the fear or the anxiety, having the curiosity about trying something new and, you know, sort of being okay if it's not perfect at first and, and repeating it until it becomes the new way that we do things. That makes so much sense. And Tara, what about... Um the role neuroplasticity plays with dealing with failure and especially maybe how the difference between how women deal address failure and how men deal with it. So the thing about the brain is that its main job is, to, is for us to survive and reproduce. It's that primal. And so in terms of survival, the brain is geared to avoid loss 2.5 times as much as it is to get a reward. So failure, unfortunately, has, you know, quite a draining effect on the brain. Um, and so how what I think is really important, and this applies equally to men and women, 
is to reframe failure as an opportunity to learn. So, you know, I really say a mistake is only a mistake if you learn nothing from it. Um, of course, we'd all rather learn from near misses than actual failures. Um, but the, the true resilience is being able to bounce back from a perceived failure as quickly as possible, try a new way of being and move forward positively. That's really great and so important. And especially, I think, you know, the, the role of resilience in our lives has become so important over the last year. Um, is there anything else from neuroscience or neuroplasticity that you can um, mention in terms of, you know, building that resilience and how do we use resilience to cope with all this change? Absolutely. I mean, we need to sort of be employing neuroplasticity to cultivate little bits of resilience into our life all the time. And I've certainly found, you know, I've had the advantage of being a neuroscientist and, and having chosen to cultivate resilience in my life, that I've really seen that, you know, pay, get paid back this last year. So there are some very, very simple ways to start, which are mostly based on the physical foundations that keep your brain optimally performing and your mental health as positive as it can be. And they are rest, fuel, hydrate, oxygenate and simplify. And I always say, change 10 things by 1%. Don't try to make one big 10% change in your life because that's really hard work for your brain. But if you go to bed half an hour earlier, um, eat more oily fish, drink one extra glass of water per day, walk 10,000 extra steps per day and do five, 10, 12, 15 minutes of meditation per day. That's already five things that will massively boost your brain power. And once you feel the benefits of those, you might want to sort of take it to the next level and focus on having your sleep and wake times exactly the same, because that's an additional benefit to just the you know eight hours of good quality sleep. You might look at getting your hydration levels right up to where they should be, which is half a litre of water for every 15 kilos or 30 pounds of your body weight per day. You might incorporate more leafy greens, nuts and seeds, eggs, dark foods like blueberries and black beans, um, because they've got higher levels of antioxidants, which is great for our brain. Um, you know, you may be able to increase your meditation practice. But to be honest, I... I don't focus too much on a formal sit down, close your eyes and meditate. I do mindful eating, mindful walking. I pay full attention to my loved ones when that's what I'm doing. Um, I do digital detoxes and um, I do use um, mantras or positive affirmations because I find that they're really useful throughout the day or in difficult times. Um, yeah, so, you know, you can easily build up two or three habits at a time and at the end of the year find that 10 or 12 things that you didn't do the year before, you're doing all the time now. So going into a global pandemic with a good sleep habit, with a healthy diet, with you know drink, being used to drinking so much water, um, I was able to really listen to my body. And for example, as I became much more sedentary sitting at the, you know, the laptop more than before, um, I decided to get a Peloton because I could actually physically feel that it didn't suit me to be so inactive um, and that I had to do something um, to make sure that I could easily access sort of getting that blood flow and that oxygen yeah. going. If you can't, if you don't have time to do exercise during the working day, then even just taking 10 deep breaths will increase the, the uh, flow of oxygen in the blood to your brain. So, so many little things that we can do. That is great. I mean, Peloton has been a huge success story. There's so many private net networks, even within our industry of this Peloton clubs. And um, so, yeah, that's that's been fun. But I think there's a really great uh, tips because to think of, you know, the 10 things you need to do uh, is quite full on. But the sort of the bite size um, um, changes in our behavior we can all try definitely makes sense. Tara, um, it's been fascinating to speak to you and I really look forward to seeing you in person soon and next week for your event with uh, Mo Gaudat. And um, so I thank you so much for taking part in our forum. Thank you. I'm excited that you're coming to the happiness webinar as well with Roxy Nafuzi and Mo Gaudat. He's, he's, oh, they're both great. So um, 
Yeah, see you there. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you. Take care.